Steve Michael, I'm going to give you my basic blurb on David. I, I feel really honored that he's been willing to come and speak to us. David comes via uh, Jakarta, India, Indonesia, and I believe he's only been here a very short time. He's um, recently uh, taken up the role as the uh, head, head man, a school principal at White Rock Christian Academy. That's had a fabulous reputation for years and years in, in BC and across the world. Um, he was actually in Indonesia for four and a half years and he's got lots of exciting things to tell us how um, it seems with uh, God's help uh, he took a school from 90 <laughs> students to 700. And something special must be going on there in heaven and on earth to, to have such... Um, uh, multiplication. Uh, David's over here with his family. His, his wife, I believe, is a child psychologist, and um, she she loves doing that. And I'm not going to say any more than that. But I, I, if you could put a round of applause together for David Michaels, that'd be great. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. I hope you can hear me clearly. It's okay. And uh, what a blessing it is to be able to share some time with you today. We're going to get a little bit of a PowerPoint happening for you. I just want to start by saying I'm, I'm claiming a verse uh, from the Psalms today that has really been a part of my life, I think, over the last five years particularly. Just, you can see it up here, the Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. I've really uh, come to appreciate this verse um, more in a personal way uh, over the last five years. So I'd like to share my testimony with you today and, and some more recent experiences that, um, that both my wife and I have had. Uh, but I want you to know, first of all, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior at a very early age and then rededicated my life to Him again in my late teens. I went to university, trained to be a teacher, and then married my wife, Nancy, and I think there should be a picture of her next, if you could put that up. She's a lot better looking than I am, that's for sure. And uh, together, we have four children. I think the next slide is there. You can see our, our family. Uh, we have four children, they're all married, and we have now four grandchildren. I suppose that's probably the biggest reason why we came back to, uh, to BC, to Canada. How do we know God's purpose in our lives? You know, we can often look back and marvel how God has demonstrated his purpose in the past. Uh, but it can be very challenging to know what his purpose is for us today or certainly even into the future. It's five years ago, I was living a very comfortable life with these beautiful people that you can see behind me. Um, with an opportunity for early retirement, I know I look much too young to be retired, um, I wondered where God might lead me next. And my life had been rather predictable, comfortable, and reasonably secure. However, at that time in my life, God revealed His new purpose for me. Now let me just put that into context for you. A teacher, a principal, and a director in the Langley School District for almost 34 years. Very, very comfortable situation. But God knew that just being comfortable was not enough, and that I needed to put more faith and trust in Him. So in June 2009, uh, I was visited by a good Christian friend and former professional colleague, I don't know, sometimes you put a name on, you never know, somebody might know him, Greg Fadigan. Does anybody know Greg Fadigan? Well, he's a very good friend of mine. And he'd been working overseas, uh, initially in India, and then more recently in Indonesia. And he told me about a, an opportunity that, uh, that I might be interested in, in coming to, to work with him in Indonesia. Well, God's perfect timing, I think, was revealed at that time. The earliest I could retire as a high school principal was December 2009, and the new position that Greg presented to me started and was advertised to begin January 2010. So that was pretty neat timing, as we as we see, and it was it was exciting. So uh, the next slide, early in uh, 2010, my wife Nancy and I left Vancouver, Jakarta, to Jakarta, where I began as the founding head of school of, of, of a school. It's a bit of a mouthful. Sekola Pelik, the head of that international. Among village. And uh, what you can see here is a, a bit of a map. I'll just turn around a bit. And uh, over here, you can see here's where Jakarta is. I gotta tell you, we were, <laughs> we 
we were really surprised. We had no idea where Indonesia was. We heard the country before, but we didn't know where it was. We had to get on the map. Well, where is this place? So this is all Indonesia here. And you can see that it's close to Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand. The Philippines are up here. Here's Australia down here. Now we're getting something a little bit more familiar. And you've heard of these countries before, but I had no idea where it was. Well, here's Jakarta. Um, Jakarta, by the way, has 20... 6 million people living. 26 million people in the Jakarta region. You know, that's amazing, isn't it? We should know more about this, these countries, that's for sure. Um, so, next slide is, the city of Jakarta was quite interesting to us. It looks like quite a modern city, doesn't it? And uh, we were quite interested when we first arrived and we saw Jakarta. Now, this next slide you can see is something a little bit different, though. This is also Jakarta. You know, we were stretched by a mix of extremes, it seemed, between progress and simplicity, wealth and poverty, as evidenced by most developing countries and cities. But we continually experienced Jakarta as a city of extreme contrasts, with evidence of wealth and progress right next to the more prominent sites of poverty and simplicity. And finally, though, we became accustomed, you know, to this this living in this incredible city. And hearing frequent calls to prayer starting at about 4.30 in the morning, daily, projected loudly from speakers from many mosques. And we were just saying to Greg earlier that uh, you know this is a country with 90% Islam. My 90% Muslim. And mosques all over. And they have loud speakers starting at 4.30. Where we live, we could hear about 4 or 5. And I swear they were competing with each other. I'm not sure who would win. Anyway, this... Uh, Indonesian country is the fourth largest country in the world. Did you know that? The fourth largest in the world. So the largest is China, followed by India, followed by the USA, and then Indonesia. 250 million people. So very interesting. Next slide on there. The initial challenges inherent in opening a new international school included First, marketing. I'm sorry, we should maybe move through here a little bit. Just the next slide. Here it is. This is a, the, the school that I was the head of. And you can see it's in its construction stage. I say the initial challenges were inherent in opening a new international school included marketing, hiring national and expat teachers, as well as an administrative and support staff, developing the curriculum, fitting the school with supplies and equipment, and throughout all that, monitoring the construction. Sometimes we complain about things being overregulated here in this country, you know, when you're in construction. Well, this is a good example of a place that's underregulated. I won't tell you about all the workers that were not wearing hard hats and not wearing shoes and things like that. It was quite, quite something. Uh, next slide. Our, our scheduled opening day was August 2010, and the school building uh, was still not complete, but we still went ahead anyway. God blessed us with just under 100 students. The staff and students stood together as what we call pioneers sharing the excitement of starting a new school, an international Christian school in the heart of Jakarta. And over the past four years, uh, the school has continued to thrive. And again, the projected enrollment is over 700 students for this particular current school year. Not bad, you know, you're not gonna be, you'll be really surprised with this, the tuition. Anybody that's got uh, related to White Rock Christian Academy, uh, you'll be surprised. The, the tuition was 25,000 US to go to this school. 25,000 US dollars, yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, the, uh, it was the newest school of four campuses uh, that provided private Christian education to both the upper class national Indonesian as well as expatriate students from kindergarten to grade 12 and these students were from all over the world. You might say, well, how could it be that you charge so much? Uh, the wealthy uh, Indonesian were the Chinese Indonesian and they were strong in business and they were uh, very clever and they were bright, bright, and they were very wealthy. And the Indonesian education system is ranked one of the worst in, in the world. So they wouldn't want to send their children to you know, the public school system in Indonesia. They want to send them to a private school, a school that would get them over to North America for their universities. And you know, it's great because many of them came back to Indonesia, and they would be leaders, and, and they would be uh, with a strong Christian uh, influence, which we thought was important in our job in terms of preparing them. But I want to tell you, I'm sure that God did not just call us to uh, Indonesia to start a, a wealthy school like this. I think it was something else. His purpose for me was, was I think, more than that. Um, I, I want to share with you today, the church that we belong to is the Salvation Army. 
we attend the Salvation Army here in Burnaby, it's called Carrie Hill Temple. And in fact, before I went, I was very involved in music ministry. I was the bandmaster of the band, and some of you may know the band actually has come and played to a couple of churches here in White Bar. Um, for over 20 years, I was the leader of the band. And, uh, so it was, it's always had a special part in my life, being a part of the Salvation Army. So I was really quite interested to learn a little bit more about the Salvation Army when we went to Indonesia. Amazing. The Salvation Army in Indonesia has 100 schools. They have 20 hospitals. They have 20 homes which uh, are for orphanages and seniors. They have 400 churches and 50,000 members. Isn't that amazing? So it, it's, a, it's a church that is alive and, and doing very well. So we were quite surprised by that. But having said that, it's not a wealthy um, church at all. You know, here um, you'll see at Christmas time the bell ringers. Mm -hmm. They're collecting money to support the ministries of the Salvation Army. Maybe some of you donate. There's a, you know, you call a Red Shield Appeal, and they have a mail up to people, and people contribute on a regular basis to support the work of the Salvation Army here in Canada. Can't do that in Indonesia. With 90% uh, Muslim, it's just impossible. So they are reliant on gifts that come from outside the country or within their own means. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of an example of what their own means. Of course, uh, we were very um, interested in the school system, and maybe just the next slide here. Um, this is uh, Indonesia again, and all these red names actually are the main islands of Indonesia. All right? So Java, I know that sounds like coffee to you, but Java is where Jakarta is. Sumatra, does that sound other than coffee here, right? But that's quite a big island there. Um, Bali, I'm sure everybody's heard of Bali. It's actually a very small little island, but delightful. West Timor, you've probably heard about East Timor over the last few years because that broke away from Indonesia. Papua, maybe heard of Papua New Guinea, but Papua on this, this side over here is a separate part of Indonesia. Kalimantan, well actually, maybe you've heard of Borneo. This, this whole island is called Borneo. Half of it's Malaysia, the other half is Indonesia, and the Indonesian part is called Kalimantan. But this is the place I want to bring to your attention. Sulawesi, what a beautiful island it is. It's absolutely phenomenal. 70% of the Salvation Army group is in Sulawesi. And we had an opportunity of going there in November 2011. So I went with a group. And uh, just tell you a little bit about that. The next slide, please. We went to visit one of the schools. This is a very typical school that's run by the Salvation Army. Uh, the name of the school is Dombu Mountain School. <laughs> so we went up this winding road that took us to Dombu Mountain. Um, and uh, maybe the next slide as well, you can see. Uh, this is a guy on his motorcycle. I was quite remarkable to see how many things you could put on a motorcycle. <laughs> or how many people you could put on a motorcycle. That was always exciting. But you see the homes protruded right off the mountain. It was quite something. The next slide, please. And here's the village. This is the village school. Very poor area. The next slide. And here's the classroom where the kids are. We took this picture. I was there. Nothing on the walls. No electricity. Whenever it rained, they closed the school down because the roof would leak so much. About 80 students in the school. I said, well, are there any other students that uh, are a part of this, uh, that live in this area? Yeah, it's about 35, but they don't come to school. Well, why wouldn't they come to school? School would be a great place for them. I said, well, their parents cannot afford a uniform. A uniform? Are you kidding me? That's the only thing holding them back? That's what it is. Their parents are too proud to send their children to school if they don't have a uniform and they can't afford it. You know what a uniform costs? There, around $25. That's shoes and all. $25 one year can provide an education for the student. It's amazing, isn't it? So this was in my mind. How can we help the schools in the Salvation Army? How can we do that? And it took a long time to process, to be honest with you. I know I'm going to run out of time here. I'll do my, my best to quickly move through this. Um, <clears throat> all the way up to Dumbu Mountain, I noticed a lot of cocoa plants. That kind of just went to the back of my mind. The following, that was November 2011, the following summer we came back for holidays and, and we live in, in Langley, not too far from Fort Langley, up in the Walnut Grove area. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife and I went for a bike ride and we rode all the way into Fort Langley. And we stopped, there was a new coffee shop there, so we stopped in to have a cup of coffee. And on the board were coffee beans from all over the world. And of course, we've just come from Indonesia. Where is anything from Indonesia? There's nothing from Indonesia. You know, all of a sudden, God spoke to me. Coffee. I know he did. His spirit spoke to me. Coffee. I didn't know what he meant, but I heard it loud and clear. Coffee. I said that to my wife. There's something about coffee. I don't know what it is. We went home, and I saw my son was there. Uh, my son Chris, who's a recording engineer, 
And uh, I said, Chris, we've just been on a bike ride, and I don't know what, I told him about Down the Mountain before, and he said, I want coffee. He said, oh, Dad, you've got to talk to John Darch. I said, well, who's John Darch? <laughs> he said, well, John Darch is the father of Rob Darch, who owns the recording studio where I work. Well, why would I want to talk to John Darch? He said, well, John's into the coffee business. He's into the coffee business, some a place in northern Thailand called Doi Chang. And um, that's interesting. What's he doing there? And Chris once said, I don't know, Dad, but I know it has something to do with helping the people out in Doi Chang. So Chris, I'm leaving to go back to Indonesia in two days. How can you get me in to meet John Darch? The next day, I was having lunch with John Darch in the Hotel of Vancouver. Now, let me tell you, John Darch is a multimillionaire, okay? He's not a He's not a, a, a practicing Christian, but it was interesting in our conversation to learn all the things that he's doing about this Deutsching community. This is a community way high in the mountains of northern Thailand. And at one point, they were harvesting opium. As many places up in the mountains of Thailand were, some of you may know that. They've now started harvesting coffee, which is great, but they couldn't sell this high quality Arabica coffee to anyone, and they would, if they tried to, they wouldn't get the value that it's worth. So he went in and tried to help them do this in developing their coffee. All of the best hot coffee beans, maybe come through a couple of, next slides, for Joy Chain Coffee. Maybe just go back, back to the Joy Chain Coffee slide. Oh, you can. Oh yeah, there, there thank you. There's Joy Chain Coffee. This, you can buy this in Safeway, here today. You can buy it in Costco and lots of other places. So he brought in Joy Chain Coffee. 50% of all the profit that he brings that, that we sell in Canada go right back to the Deutsche community. And it's, it's wonderful. So these people now have roads and schools and hospitals. And, uh, and believe it or not, they now are selling coffee in Thailand. There's more Deutsche coffee stores in Thailand than Starbucks. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Next slide. This tells you this is the coffee. And what we were telling us, these particular coffee, green beans are the big ones, are the ones that come back to Canada. They're the best beans, all right? So they're the, the AAA uh, call. He was explaining this to us and how he's been able to help. Well, then I told him about my story about Donkey Mountain. And I wanted to repeat it to you because you've heard it. He looked at me and he said, I have to tell you something, Dave. When I was a young boy being brought up in the UK, I attended a Salvation Army Sunday School. There's only one organization that I give anything to it, money to, and that's the Salvation Army. How can I help you? Isn't that amazing? So you kind of see how God is working through all of us. It was just amazing. To cut a long story short, today there are 2,000 farmers in Sulawesi who bring their green coffee bees directly to the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army doesn't make any profit. They just send it straight to a distributor and give these farmers better value for their coffee than they've ever had because they've eliminated the middleman. You know, the middleman gets in there and takes up all the money so they don't have anything, right? So now they're getting directly. And we were so excited, like just a weekend ago or so, we heard now they're starting to sell their coffee from Indonesia to the Salvation Army in America. Can you imagine how many institutions the Salvation Army has in America? Huge, right? And so they're soon to be selling, or sorry, drinking, Salvation Army coffee from Indonesia in the Salvation Army institutions in the USA. And of course, they're going to pay for that. And all that extra money is going to come back to the Salvation Army in Indonesia to help support their schools and hospitals. Isn't that a wonderful blessing? Yeah. We just feel so uh, incredible about this opportunity that was there. Um, maybe go through a couple of slides. There. Okay, I'll come to that in one second. We've done have a number of other initiatives that we're involved in. Um, it was really exciting. We connected wealthy Indonesian businessmen with uh, Salvation Army projects and uh, contributed significantly to that. Facilitating discussions between the Salvation Army hospitals and other Christian hospital groups for the purpose of uh, developing cost sharing initiatives. So, you know, they're buying in bulk, they save a lot of money. And that's been great. We've been supporting the Indonesian territorial agribusiness, not just coffee, but some of the other um, uh, products that, they, that they're working on. This one's quite interesting because we've been able to encourage Salvationists throughout Indonesia to get a better education. These young people here, aren't they lovely? Aren't they wonderful? These are Indonesian young people with the exception of, oh, this is Mark Burton. He's actually from Alisford, and that's my wife and I. And these are just some of the young people now that are studying at University Pelita Harapan in their teacher's college. They actually are having a free tuition for four years, free room and board for four years. We're going to get a university degree 
as a result of this. Now what they have to do is they have to come back and give back to the organization. Some of them would be working in a school like where I was working, and there's, there's a problem probably about 35 different schools in the organization. So some of them will be going to schools that are in the far-reaching parts of Indonesia, Christian education, but quality, um, quality uh, teaching, and we're really kind of excited that we can promote that. Next slide, please. There are several uh, references in the Old Testament and the New Testament to the four vulnerable groups and those uh, we are instructed to care for. The poor, the orphans, the widows, and the foreigners. And this next slide tells us, for example, in the Psalms, He executes justice for the oppressed, He gives food to the hungry, the Lord set prisoners free, and the Lord gives sight to the blind. He lifts up those who are bowed down, and the Lord loves those who live justly. The Lord watches over the immigrant, He sustains the fatherless and the widow, but He frustrates the ways of the wicked. And even Jesus told the disciples to sell their possessions and give it to the poor. We're instructed in the Bible about these four particular groups. Um, we talk about the Lord's purpose in our lives and certainly since being in Indonesia we've come to appreciate a new perspective for these four groups and again the next slide please hope you can see that the first group the poor hard to understand but the average Indonesian lives on a salary of $150 a month $150 a month it's amazing um, we saw this poverty we saw that actually even with some the Salvation Army officers. We got into their homes and they prepared a bank of four stuff you could never imagine. And yet we know their home was so, you know, limited in what they could provide. But yet their graciousness to us was just an amazing gift. We just felt so blessed. Orphans, we, uh, we visited many orphanages. Some were better than others. Uh, but we never had visited these kind of institutions before. Orphanages are, are not so much part of our culture here. Um, you know, children are in foster homes and things like that. But what they do in, in Indonesia and other parts of the world is they bring you know, orphans together. Um, I, I'll try and be really quick on this. It's just such a blessing in many ways. There was a, a Christian orphanage not run by the Salvation Army called Samuel's House. And this orphanage was closed down. And the Ministry of Child and Family in Indonesia took all the children away because of the accusation of physical and sexual abuse. Uh, the pastor Samuel was arrested, and uh, it's a terrible thing. And it was in the news all over the place, right? And it was, you know, the fact that it was a Christian orphanage too in a, in a country that's by, primarily Muslim, you know, they, they were attacking Christians in this way. Um, I'm not going to judge Pastor Samuel, but a, a lot of the evidence they had was pretty solid, I think, you know, so, um, and it was coming from the children themselves, so statements from the children. So we know that there was abuse that happened, and I don't know if Pastor Samuel was the one or not, but that's what the kids were saying, so I say I don't want to judge him, but these kids were taken away. Uh, I have two secretaries. Uh, one secretary came to me uh, a few days after this happened, and it was in the following day, I was going to the Salvation Army Territorial Headquarters to talk to them about a few other initiatives. She said, uh, by the way, I was not called Mr. Michael. I was called Mr. Dave. That was my name in Indonesia. So she said, Mr. Dave, you know, I know you're going there. Could you see if it's possible that these children could be looked after by the Salvation Army and their organizations? I said, well, I'll do my best. I'll mention it to them. So that next day I did. I, I spoke. I brought it up as a, an item of our discussion. Their response was, we would love to help these children, we would love to place them, but you know, the problem is we don't know where they are. They're, they've been apprehended by this ministry, you know, who knows where they are. But if you know, you're hearing, just let us know, we'd be happy to help. So I went back and I told the secretary, her name was Hika, and then uh, the next day, the other secretary came, she was away for a few days, Melissa, so you can picture the office. Hika's talking to Melissa, Hika's saying all of her concerns about these children from San Jose. and Melissa says, that's interesting. You know, my husband and I know the lawyer that's representing the children. What? you got to go in and see Mr. Dave right away. So they came and they were so excited. And I said, well, tell the lawyer to come and see me. Within two hours, he was in my office. And again, we were just so excited. We found out just a week ago, the Salvation Army now has placed 13 of the 30 children, and they're looking to place the others in their orphanages. What a great place. You know, when you're wondering what your purpose is, you don't know, do you? You know? Um, 
we, we just have to be obedient to God's call on us. So that was kind of exciting. The third group of widows, we certainly saw more than our share of older women who were begging on the streets. And, and then finally, foreigners. You know, we're talk, talking about how we are to look after the foreigners. This is a tough one. Um, have you heard of the boat people before? Australia really knows about the boat people. Have you heard about the situation in terms of the boat people in Australia? What they do actually is they come to Indonesia, hop on a boat, and they go almost to Christmas Island, which is Australian territory. And the boat is, is actually set to, to sink. And so then, you know, they, the rescue comes from Christmas Island to bring them back there, and so then they can, come, you know, can you know, declare themselves as, as refugees. Well, what's happening, of course, is Australia has really had a backlash against these people. And, and, uh, but all over the world, people are trying to get into you know, situations, or maybe they're trying to get out of where they are. You know, when we think of refugees, sometimes we don't necessarily have a positive thought about them because we think of these boat people and others that take advantage of systems, but we certainly learn something different. Um, we met this next slide, here's put up here. Here's Ayeli and Abinet, and they're from Ethiopia. We met them, they were part of our small group Bible study. They were persecuted in, in Ethiopia. They are political um, refugees, so to speak. But what I didn't realize, there's a term called asylum seeker. And, and this is an important thing for us to understand, because when you leave your country and you go to some other country, you actually have to declare yourself as an asylum seeker. You're seeking asylum away from where you live. It takes a year to get refugee status. And then once you get refugee status, it may take another couple of years before you're actually placed in another country. In this case, um, Ayeli and, and Abin had spent a year as asylum seekers in Jakarta, no income, and they weren't allowed to work. How do you live? You know, it was the church that actually looked after them, and we were so blessed to get to know them and realize them and have a different perspective of refugees than what we had before. Um, and I'm happy to say they're now in Brisbane, Australia, and, and you know, settling into a new way of life. But it certainly was very interesting for us to see a different side of things than what we read in the paper and to meet these people. Well, our involvement in building a new school in the heart of Jakarta and supporting the work of the Salvation Army and meeting refugees like Ayeli and Abin, it became a special time of spiritual growth as we learned more about God's purpose in calling us to Indonesia. I think the words of Peter became a reality in our lives, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. We learn to put our faith in God, especially during times of uncertainty and feeling totally inadequately prepared to address many challenges and opportunities. But it seemed that more we were stressed beyond our comfort zone, comfort zone of what we had right here, the more we need to put our faith and trust in God. And just this last slide, please. And just in time for Canada Day on July the 1st, 2014, we returned to Vancouver. God has continued to reveal the details of his intention in our lives. We definitely miss much about Indonesia and chiefly our valued friendships there. But we we're blessed to again to be close to our family and friends and to reconnect to our church and to resume our professional um, careers here in Vancouver. And yeah, I've accepted with the position of principal of White Rock Christian Academy. And by the way, my first day on the job was July the 2nd. So we arrived on July the 1st, and I started on July the 2nd. Uh, so I didn't have much time in between that. Um, we will forever be grateful for the opportunity to have lived and served in Indonesia, and we remain strongly committed to supporting the Salvation Army Ministries there. But we move on following our valued four and one half years in Indonesia with an, ex an enriched understanding of Paul's statement to the Church of Philippi. And you know this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you for listening. God bless you all. Thank you, David. I'm very impressed. He finished more or less on time. But I could have listened to more. Um, you know, I remember um, before I understood anything about Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father, I remember at 18 years of age, I heard a, a talk from a group called Equip who were equipped to send people all over the world to help the poor. And I'll never forget, they showed one slide, I told David this yesterday. And I saw one slide of this man on a park bench, I assume he was in England, with a brown bag wrapped around it. 
and it broke my heart because I just got this, if, if you like, a revelation that that man was just broken hearted and he was dousing himself with this, with this liquid, whatever it was, whiskey, uh, vodka, and my heart broke for this man. I, I can never forget that moment where I had such deep comp compassion for this man. And whether you think you believe in God or don't believe in God today, you know, we're all vulnerable. You know, we're, we're all, we, can, we're, we all can be weak whether we like it or not, you know. And uh, what for the grace of God for all of us today. And do uh, you know when I hear about figures like it's $25 US yeah. to put a, a precious one in school and then <laughs> 25,000 to, to, to go into this fancy concrete building. What a contrast, what a contrast Indonesia is, as David said. A place of contrast. $25 to 25,000. I want to go there, I don't know about you. I would love to go there, I'd love to spend some time there. I wish I had a fast plane and I could go every couple of weeks and just, I'm a, I, I taught for 20 years, design all over the world. But I don't know. To, I don't know about you. That just touches my heart. I feel challenged. I really do. And, uh, so thank you for coming today. Really appreciate you just listening to David. I wish we'd have had 85 people here today, but the right people were here.